to a, a platter of, of fish. And the problem is that we humans love sun animals so much that we'll literally eat them to extinction. Mm -hmm. We did it with the dodos, we did it with the passenger pigeons, you know we're going to do it with bluefin tuna, and pretty much most of the other snappers and groupers and trevallies and tunas, unless we find some other sustainable surrogate. So that's what Kampachi Farms is. We are working at we are working at the nexus of ecological imperative and economic opportunity to be able to grow the seafood that you all crave and that the whole planet craves. I mean, we're looking at by 2050 a planet of nine billion people. There are going to be another three billion people that move up into the middle class. And the next time you're sitting down to a ben sushi bento lunch, you think about those three billion other people that want to eat your lunch. <laughs> so it's not going to come from wild stocks. There are not plenty more fish in the sea. We've already taken out over 90% of the big fish mm -hmm. out there. There are projections that if we don't change the way that we're essentially strip mining the oceans, yes. by 2048, all of the stocks out there will have collapsed down to less than 10% of their original mm -hmm. biomass. So we have to change our relationship with the oceans. It's no longer just a take, take, take. We have to figure out how to nurture mm. the seafood that we crave. And we're going to do that over the horizon because the nearshore waters, as I'll explain here, we can grow fish in nearshore waters and we can do it with no measurable environmental footprint, but we can't scale there. And everybody else wants to use the nearshore waters for their fishing or diving or sailing or whatever else they're doing. So we have to move out into deeper water, further offshore. That's where there's less ecological footprint. That's where there's some biological synergies. And that's where we can use some really cool new technologies to be able to drive deep water offshore fish pens. So I'm gonna talk about the history here that got us to this point. You will have heard of, of Compachi, I would hope, uh, it, it, it's just, uh, I hope that you've all actually had the, the, the pleasure of sampling it at yes. some stage here. It's a beautiful fish, and we were the first folk outside of Japan to be able to commercialise that fish. So it was a real honour to be able to do that. I'm going to talk about why we need to move into deeper water further offshore. I'm going to describe the Valella beta test, which was our first attempt at over-the-horizon aquaculture, and then the gamma test, which was the subsequent follow-up to that, I'm going to talk about the broader recognition that we are seeing now about open ocean aquaculture and where we see the future growth opportunities. This is the fish that we've all come to know and love so much. Uh, originally, we were selling this as branded Kona Kampachi, a branded fish into the sushi trade. Nobody's ever really done that before. Yeah, there are a couple of branded salmon out there and there's Copper River wild salmon, but uh, this had tremendous traction. This fish has tremendous traction in the... The, the mainland markets, and also here at the high-end sushi restaurants here. The beauty of the beauties, the many fold, among the many fold beauties <laughs> of, of Kona Kampachi, uh, that uh, it, it tastes great, both as a fundamentally it tastes great, both as a sashimi and as a cooked product. So unlike the Japanese hamachi, which you'll only ever find in sushi restaurants, this was also in white tablecloth restaurants at the center of the plate, and then we were getting spill over into retail, and into broadline restaurants across the, the US as well. It also grows very quickly. Uh, it will get to a, an average of around two kilos in about uh, a year offshore, 10 months to, to 12 months out offshore. Uh, they're very amenable to both culture in tanks and then culture in cages. That they're naturally schooling when they're juveniles and then as they get larger, you'll find them in twos and trees or smaller schools. But so they work very well. They just they like each other. They they <laughs> like being cultured. They like being nurtured. They have a very good feed conversion efficiency. This is again you, you'll hear me a, a number of times talk about this overlap of economics and environmental economic opportunity and environmental imperative in the feed conversion efficiency. That's where this really comes to a nexus because if we're going to grow aquaculture the way that we have to to feed a planet of 9 billion people, we can't do it on the back of Peruvian anchovies. Peruvian anchovy fishery is very, very well managed. Most of these small fish fisheries that are used for 
fish meal and fish oil. That, that, and most of, all, most of that goes into aquaculture. Most of the fish oil and fish meal around the world is used in aquaculture. But we can't go and, and have a, a tenfold or twentyfold increase in marine fish production and do it all with Peruvian anchovies or California sardines or Menhaden. Most of the California sardines are already all gone. Peruvian anchovies are well managed. Menhaden, that's a, these small fish, we, there's limits. There's, so long as you manage them well, they are sustainable, but they aren't scalable. And, and that's a, a key difference there. And so Campachi can, we ha have these fish, you talk about the, the, the feed conversion efficiency, how many pounds of feed it takes to get a pound of sashimi out of the, the other end there. And for Campachi, up until about a kilo, it's less than one to one, less than a pound of feed. You put in a pound of feed and you'll get 1.1 or 1.2 pounds of Campachi. <laughs> magic. Yes, it is. It sounds, wow. it sounds like magic. And you're, you're all sitting here going, ah, he's pulling my leg in. It is a little bit because the pellets, they're, they're dry pellets. And so, and the compact, they're about 20% moisture, and the compact is about 80% moisture. So that's where, but from the ecological perspective, you want to look at this from a, a fish in, fish out. How many pounds of anchovies or sardines do you have to put in to get a pound of compachi sashimi out? And this fish works. Again, it's, it, it's almost magic because this fish, we've been able to convert this so called carnivorous fish into a vegetarian. So we can use a, a lot of other sources of proteins and oils to replace the, the fish meal and the fish oil. And so we've been able to grow the compachi with absolutely, some of the trials we've done here, we've had absolutely zero mm. fish meal in the diet, completely taken the fish meal out of there. Mm. With the commercial trials that we're about to run, the third in the series here, are down to 12% fish meal. And at that point, you're getting more than a pound of compachi for every pound of anchovies or sardines that you put in there. So that makes both ecological and economic sense there. <coughs> this fish will also spawn readily in the hatchery. <coughs> Spawning is a challenge for a, a lot of marine fish. When they, they get into tanks, they get a little bit shy. Compachi, no problem. Three or four times a week they'll spawn and, and abundant spawns. We have broodstock down in Mexico now. We, we're getting 30 million eggs a month. Oh. An average of over a million eggs a day it's magic <laughs> so for all of these reasons this fish ha has it, it's, people say well wow why did you choose compachi it's kind of like we didn't choose this fish this fish chose us is the way the way that it feels you know where we are here in, in kona but why open ocean aquaculture here well this is a unique site in that it has really deep oceanic water very close to shore and it's also somewhat protected from the worst of the, the trade winds and the worst of the winter swells here. So that's why when we had been looking at, coincidentally, I've been working here for 25, 26 years. Good Lord, is it that long? <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, and, and when we were looking at open ocean aquaculture, where would we go and trial it? This is obviously a, a, a beautiful place to be going and testing this idea of growing fish in deeper water further offshore because it is oceanic within a stone's throw of the shoreline here in Kona. And so we had set up uh, in 2002 to 2004, we got on a, a, and focused on some of the bottlenecks for marine uh, fish hatchery production there. Sid had worked with us for a while on that and we had some great breakthroughs. It was a lot of fun, wasn't it, Sid? We had, over the course of that three years uh, of focused research, we had eight different marine species that we were able to produce in the hatchery and Five of those had never been produced in commercial hatcheries before anywhere in the world. Uh, and, and that was s some just really exciting work that underscored for us the opportunity that was before us there. But we needed somewhere to grow them out. And, uh, growing them out on land just made no economic sense and no ecological sense either because it's diesel driven electricity that drives the pumps here, that pumps the water, that keeps the fish alive. And, that was very expensive and it also just in terms of the global footprint that's not the way that we want to move forward so we looked at uh, open ocean aquaculture and the site that we chose was just here this is carefully point here all of the natural energy lab and we're down here at the moment so this is out off 
you know where the farm is? Does everybody know where the farm is? Mm -hmm. Some straight out off the airport there, or off uh, the <coughs> northern most edge of Sanotec Ponds. There's a grid of <coughs> moorings here, anchors at each end, because you do want to have the cages stay where you put them most of the time. Well, we'll talk about the no anchor stuff later. And then with cages uh, in the, the, the centre of each of those grids. Uh, it, it, it's a, a great site for doing this because it, it, it's deep water, it's over 200 feet deep. Uh, it, it's uh, about a uh, half a mile out offshore and there was no conflict. We went through a three year process here with community consultation to make sure there was no conflict with fishing or diving or other things here. Um, interesting, in here is where the most of the man, this bay here, uh, is where most of the manta diving and the other, there's, there's a lot of recreational tourist diving up in that bay. And one of the beauties of, of this site is there are such strong currents through there that there's no measurable impact. We, we threw 500 tons on this site in 2008. They got back up, the new company that's operating it now got back up to 500 tons last year. They're hoping to do a thousand tons next year. And there's no measurable impact on the coral reef in here. There are so many boats in there every day that you knew if we were having any impact on that coral reef there, people would be screaming. It would be on the front page of West Hawaii Today. Bless West Hawaii Today. They do a wonderful job <laughs> of, of, of just keeping everybody in this town on their toes. Uh, and, and you know that you'd, you'd, you'd see it there and there would be a furor about that, and justly so, uh, because our corals are already very, very heavily stressed. Uh, and so, that's a great validation point that we've been able to do this production of the Kampachi up there. We've been out there now since 2005 was the first year that we were out. We ran that operation from 2005 until 2009. Uh, if you remember 2009, that was when everybody ran out of money and yeah, our investors yes. ran out of money as well. <laughs> so that's when we transitioned across the company that had been making the cages came in and took it over and they've been carrying it forward mm -hmm. ever since. So this is actually, you can hear me talk about, well, nobody's complained about impacts on the coral reef, but this is some data. This is representative. This is just one monthly monitoring of water quality up current. The blue bars there are the control sites at the surface, in the middle, which is about the cage level, and then at the bottom, just a meter above the bottom there. So the, the blue bars are on the up current side of the cages, so that's the control, there's no and the white bars on the down current side of the cages there. And this is what we would see month after month after month and what the new company has seen. Again, I think that there, this was happening so consistently that the State Department of Health said, okay, we can back off and do this monitoring every quarter now. But so there was, this was just for turbidity, but the uh, EPA mandates that you've got to measure a whole suite uh, of various potential uh, parameters that could be impacted. Turbidity is the one that if you're going to see an impact, uh, this is what you'd see it in first, because it's, turbidity really is just a polite term for fish poo. It's stuff in the water. <laughs> and so with all of those fish there, you'd see just the particulate stuff in there. Um, no impact. This, however, is the, the anecdotal, clearer, <laughs> more vibrant demonstration of the fact that there is no significant impact on the water quality out there. This is one of the subsurface buoys. That grid that I talked about there is held in place at the correct depth by these big buoys that are about this big around. This is maybe five feet tall, this buoy here. And it is covered with fossil opera. This is the, the uh, this is Damocornus. This, this is the cauliflower coral here. Mm -hmm. Covered. This is about 25 meters down current of the cages there. So if the fish were having any impact on the water quality, any deleterious impact, coral, which are, are widely recognized as being a very sensitive indicator on water quality, you wouldn't be getting coral here. You'd be getting big algae growth, sea, limu, seaweed growing on there. So that's some really powerful anecdotal evidence of no impact. So that was kind of the blue water farm. A lot of fun. We learned a lot. Uh, I'm really impressed with what this new company is doing to transition to new uh, cages. And they're putting a lot of investment into the new hatchery down here. And they're doing a great job in terms of, of furthering this technology. Um, so 
give them all the support when you go to local sushi bars or if you ever hear people bad mouthing fish farming, reach across and gently pat them on the cheek and say, wait, 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 wait. No, no. <laughs> so Kampachi Farms is, that's the company that, that my uh, COO and myself, when we had to go and, and uh, roll up Kona Blue Water Farms, uh, we wanted, we still see an opportunity here with taking Kampachi globally. This is a fish that's distributed throughout the warm waters of the world. It's a fish that if we do this right, it could be the warm water salmon of the world. Uh, it, it's a fish that has that much palate appeal and it, it, it's a fish that's destined for domestication, if you will. So we wanted to look at the, the global opportunity here. and We also wanted to look at what were the real constraints to growing this. And okay, here in Hawaii, part of the challenge is always regulatory, either the state government or the federal government. Thank you very much, David, for all that you do. But <coughs> it's not something that one person can solve. There is a very, very difficult Gordian knot of regulation that are very, that they err on the side of caution, and perhaps they do err in that way. Perhaps they are too strong, but there, there ought to be more opportunity for people to go out there and test the stuff, I would think. Because the, the evidence <coughs> is abundantly clear that if, even if you go out and you botch something with open ocean aquaculture or with net pen culture, and then you say, okay, that didn't work, pull the net pens out pretty much universally, that the substrate will revert to its natural state within six to 12 months. Unless you're going to do it somewhere stupid, like on top of a coral reef. So, okay, don't do it on a coral reef. Do it out over sand somewhere. And if, the, if the worst possible thing happens, six to 12 months there. So there are regulatory constraints. There's also the constraint about public license. Just getting the, the community to accept having what is a common property resource converted to commercial gain. Okay, we're, we're used to land being divided up and, and owned, but we're not used to that in the ocean. It's mares libra, freedom of the seas. Well, that's not actually how the Polynesians used to do it. The, the Polynesians, the upper kuwa'a would extend out. Uh, th there have been various suggestions as whether it went out to the edge of the reef or went out as far as the eye could see. So there, there was a very clear sense of marine tenure in Polynesian culture because by having clear tenure, you're able to manage the resources more effectively. It's not just every man for himself tragedy of the commons. But, okay, public license, it, it's always going to be a challenge to get the public to accept use of um, the common property resource. And then there are the ecological constraints as well, that, that we can't just keep, as I said, can't grow enough fish for nine billion people on the narrow band within a mile or two of shoreline. So our answer to this in Campachi Farms to overcome the regulatory and the public license issues is to move to Mexico. The Mexican government is keenly aware of what has happened to the fisheries for shrimp, for sardines, for tuna um, in the Sea of Cortez. They are gone. The Mexican government keenly understands the importance of aquaculture to feed the 80 million people in Mexico. And so we showed up there with the technology to do these fish in the hatchery and do them offshore, the Mexican government said, this is wonderful, how can we help? <laughs> and so we're moving forward. If any of you have an uncle who's got a burning ambition to invest in the cutting edge of open ocean aquaculture, we've got a business plan there that we'd like to share with him. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> had to do it. But then also, we want to look at here in Hawaii, what we could be doing here in Hawaii that would address the regulatory public license and ecological challenges. And that is further offshore. And that is for the rest of the planet, the Sea of Cortez is a unique site. So that you can have open ocean aquaculture, you can have offshore fish farming, 600 miles of water. But what about the rest of the planet? There's 70% of the Earth's surface out there that's water. How are we going to figure that? We wanted to resolve this nut of further offshore. Here's more of the shameless plug here about the La Paz site. This is the Bay of La Paz, um, just the concession that we have there. We've got spawning brood stock already. The government down there is actually providing us with grants and co-investment, and the government research facility is holding our brood stock there for us and providing their technicians to keep the brood stock. It's wonderful. My Spanish is awful, otherwise I'd be, and, and my wife has tenure at the local community college. Otherwise, I, I, I don't know, I love it. I'm not really good at that. 
<laughs> so some of the other ecological constraints are, are just the inputs, as well as the, the outputs that you see, but there's also the inputs. And these are, as I've said before, eminently addressable. That We're not feeding fish to grow fish any more than... We don't have to do that any more than you have to feed small birds to your cat. Um, that we've had the fish in, fish out ratio, and you already know that because I've explained that to you earlier. We've had that down to less than one to one. And the FIFO, the, the, the fish in, fish out for fish meal, we've had down to zero, so we've been able to completely eliminate that. These fish that you see here, this is a control diet with the fish meal, and those fish over there are the soy protein concentrate based diet. That's 40 for diet, that's 40% total. And the fish on the left also have some, some carotenoids in the diet, the, 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 the astaxanthins, mm -hmm. the, the same check growth. So that's why they are a different color. But if you look carefully, the side, the fish on the right are much larger, significantly larger. We got better growth out of the total fish than we got out of the fish meal fish. So we can address the inputs, but the, the outputs, are, as I've talked about, that they're here at Kona, that they're often not, well, they're not significant, they're not measurable. Um, there's also been some work that has done the last couple of years, your federal government of work has gone and collated all the global information on net pen production and concluded that there's minimal impacts on water quality and substrate, substrate's the stuff on the bottom, so long as you're in a site that's uh, at least a quarter of a knot of current and at least as deep again as the net pen. This is the uh, ocean spar net pens that uh, are out there. They come down to about uh, 80 feet deep and then there's another 120 feet of depth of water underneath that. So plenty of good water circulation through there. There was also a study done by the National Marine Fishery Service that had looked at net pen operation in the US and had said that they had looked at all of the other um, parameters in there, potential impacts on wild stock genetics or on wild fish health and the broader ecosystem health. And they concluded that so long as the farm adheres to best management practices, which is a complicated word, but just good common sense farm operation, that there's no significant impacts on those. So then why further? Why do we go out further? It's, it's, it's really hard to do this stuff out in deep water, but as I've said, we've got to grow this industry. And these three constraints to further growth of this industry, we think can be uniquely addressed by moving out further offshore. That's what from Pachi Farms, we took the bit between our teeth, we said the only way to figure this out is to get out there. We were not completely stupid. We did, first of all, this is back in 2009 with some National Science Foundation funding. We pushed a drogue buoy out there with a GPS pinger on it and just tested. We've worked here, as I said, for up until then, it was uh, 18, 17, 18 years, and we've watched the current moving past Pearhold Point here at a regular, steady clip, almost universally moving to the north, and the fishermen will tell you, and we have watched this, that there's a huge big eddy out here in the back of the big island. The water comes around through Ali Nui Ha Ha and drives this handy clockwise eddy there. We knew it was there, but we wanted to test it, and we went out and pushed the buoy out there, and it worked. So we figured, how are we going to test it with fish? There's only one way. Let's get a cage and launch it out there. We're not completely stupid. I keep reiterating this. We did actually have the cage attached to a boat. Uh, we needed the boat there because it needed to be a, 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 we need to have divers to tend it. We need to have a, 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 feed, uh, a feed barge, something to feed the fish on. The fish don't feed themselves out there. It really is literally a desert out there. Then we also needed to tow the cage. These eddies will stand here for two to four four to six or maybe even eight weeks at a time, but then they gradually start to attenuate towards the west. And we knew that, we knew we're going to have to occasionally tow the cage, <laughs> bring it back into the next eddy as the next eddy starts to form. Otherwise, Johnston Island is going to get all the <laughs> <laughs> So we tested this with, we did some sea trials with a, a couple of larger aquapods and then they didn't work. So we said, let's do it with uh, this 100, single 132 cubic meter aquapod, this button ball. Um, design here, it had uh, a copper alloy mesh, a brass mesh material on it, and then this plastic lumber frame here. Uh, and we put a couple of thousand kampachi in it and pushed it out into the eddy. And it worked generally pretty well. I don't know, can everybody see that red line? Yeah. It's kind of squiggly, but this worked pretty well. The 
eddies that the cage was being entrained within the eddies there, occasionally we'd have to come it back in again. The trouble was that this was, sorry, not trouble, the, the distance there was actually between 3 and 75 miles offshore. Sometimes when the, the eddies weren't working or they were going the wrong direction, we'd come in really close to shore and just hold it there. The trouble was we actually were doing more towing here than we had hoped. We figured at an economical point here, if we were do towing maybe two or three percent of the time, we had only two or three days out of every couple of months tow it to get into the next eddy, that that might be economical. Diesel's expensive, and if you're going to do this at scale, with a, a, this was a couple of thousand fish, Let's see if you're going to do a couple of hundred thousand fish, or a couple of million fish, the diesel required to drag those cages is going to be pretty prohibitive. What we found is that it, there was just there was a lot of towing involved, mm. and that the wheels fall off on that there pretty much. What we did learn though, there were three really stellar things that we learned to do. Policy about the policy of ocean aquaculture, the biology, and the technology. The policy was really groundbreaking on, on a number of levels. It was attracted a lot of attention in the aquaculture world. It was the world's first unanchored fish camp. People had talked about this a lot in the past, but nobody ever been dumb enough to go and try it before until we came along. <laughs> but people had this idea of doing fishing a drifter pen, you push it out of the beach in uh, Long Beach in California, and a year later it would wash up on into Tokyo Bay and you'd harvest the tuna there, or push it into the Gulf Stream in Miami, and later on it would wash up into the Thames Estuary. That's crazy. I mean, that's the idea of drifting fish from one side of the ocean to the other. This is moderately crazy. We tie it in a, in a regional eddy here. Um, this was as sad as this is, we have to state this. The US, as a nation, has the largest EEZ on the planet, our exclusive economic zone, the 200 miles zone, the largest on the planet by a long shot. We also have the greatest amount of seafood imports by dollar value in the planet. We import over 90% of the seafood, and most of that is really high valued seafood. So, here's a question for you. How much fish was grown commercially in the US EEZ last year? Anybody want to guess? Zero, none, nada, zilch. In the US EEZ, so beyond, there's salmon farms in Washington State and Maine, um, and there's a lot of fish grown on land, but that's in state waters, I mean in federal waters, between three and 200 miles, not a sausage. This was the first time, back in our 2012 harvest, was the first time that anybody had harvested any fish, even at a research scale, from a full grow out cycle in US waters. And it also, we're very mm. proud, proud and humble at the same time to re receive a, a, the recognition from Time Magazine as one of the one of the 25 best inventions of 2012. It wasn't really our invention. I mean, other people had had the idea before. We, as I said, we were just the ones that were dumb enough to do it. So that's the, the policy at a higher level. At the local community level, this was what was really groundbreaking. Generally, there's this conventional wisdom that fishing and aquaculture are completely compatible. That fishermen hate aquaculture and fish farmers hate fishermen. No, we love <laughs> fishermen. It's just if they want to love us, all we want yes. is them to love us. They loved us. This year, when we had some guys come up to us in the harbour here at Honokahau and grab us by the metaphorical lapels and say, please don't take that cage out. That's the best fishing I've had in my life. <laughs> Because this was a giant fish aggregating device. This is the, the tuna boys that the state missed to go and put out there and to bring tuna around. This was, for some reason, with the cage and the kampachi and, and whatever else it was, this was an absolute spectacular FAD. And so local tuna fishermen were just ecstatic about this. And then we pulled it out now, heartbroken. This was, you can see some of the fish here. This was uh, on Veterans Day in 2011. There were 11, uh, 16 boats within three stone throws range of the Villanova array here. And it was wonderful. I think this is a, a great example of how aquaculture and fishing can work together. The, so that's the policy, right? The, the, the biology was absolutely astonishing. I mean, we, Loved 
this fish it already has got great biological attributes, but this is the best, the, the red line here is the best growth that we've ever seen on capacity on the offshore pen here in, in off the airport. This blue line is the average growth curve. This is a growth over time, how big the fish are. These red triangles here are the Villoa project. It was just, we were giddy. They got to harvest size in four months, two and a half kilos in seven months. They had a better F feed conversion ratio. That's again, remember that's the pounds of Kampati for every pound. Better by about 30% of what the, the moored pens would be. And the survival rate was just unbelievable. The best that we'd ever seen. Even in tanks, we expect a survival rate of maybe 85%. It was 98%. <clears throat> Didn't make the magic noise again. It was magic. <laughs> it was magic. And I love, part of the reason why I love biology so much is, is we have no idea why. <laughs> no idea why this works so well. So what do you do when, when you're a biologist and you do something that works? Well, you go, you go and you do it again. Part of why it did work so well is that the, 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 the big biological challenge in growing kampachi, everybody loves eating kampachi, so do these things called neobenedinia, which is about the size of a flea, and they attach to the skin of the kampachi. And this is the main challenge that you have in growing kampachi. What we're able to see here in the Velola beta test is that we could control, this was a typical growth of neobenedinia that we see uh, in net pens offshore. What we're able to see here is that when we started just gently towing the cage forward and cleaning, pressure wash cleaning that brass uh, alloy mesh material there to keep all the biofouling off it, that we were able to control the skin flutes, get them back down to less than one per fish, which are the wild fish out here, about one skin flute per fish. So get them down to less than they were in the wild without using any therapeutics. Now that you can use fresh water or hydrogen peroxide, these are all sort of benign bath treatments that don't hurt the fish and are environmentally, ecologically benign. We didn't even have to use any of those, just by good management strategy. Uh, we think that's the first time ever that anybody's grown any of these, the seriola fish include the hamachi and the kampachi and there's a lot of other marine fish that's, we think that's the first time ever that people have been able to do that. But the challenge here, as I said, it was the diesel fuel, the amount of towing that we had to do, but there are other challenges as well. That eddy that had been so stable for all those 17 years that we've been working here at Pebble, it wasn't watching it. Well, this actually was a La Nina year. And so the day after we launched the Valella out there, we called up the oceanographers that live somewhere here in Colorado. <laughs> We're doing this partnership with Lockheed Martin. Uh, and Lockheed Martin ha has their oceanographic remote sensing guys all based in Colorado. And we'd call them up and say, okay, uh, tell us where the eddy is and where we should be. And they said, well, you should be seeing a south current right where you are. No, it's a north current. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> we're here on the boat. We, we know which way we're drifting. <laughs> oh, oh, hang on. We'll go. It turned out that this was a La Nina year, which is the opposite. You have an El Nino year when this is, we've just gone through one of those. This was a La Nina year. And after a couple of weeks, the ocean officer just dropped their hands and said, it's a La Nina year. We don't know. We can't figure this stuff out. It's just, you'll have to figure it out yourself. So that doesn't work. When you're talking to an investor about doing a commercial operation with millions of dollars of hardware, and you can't just say, well, the ocean officers don't know. There's also the attempt, we're trying to bounce all of the remote command and control, we're working with Lockheed Martin, to bounce all of this through the satellite using iridium and this other words they use to, to describe what they do. It's engineering. I don't understand this stuff. But that proved to be really constraining. It was really expensive, really expensive. And it's also just the bandwidth there. So you couldn't get video. You could get video, but it was like one frame every two minutes. Uh, that doesn't work. You've got to be able to control your feeding for your fish. You've got to be able to get a good visual on how the fish look. You've got to be able to do things like sweep the bottom. <coughs> robotics to go and sweep the bottom or pick the cage down. You can't do that when you're that bandwidth constrained. And there was also just the whole question of the drag and the diesel, which I've bellyached about that before. So for these reasons, even though the biology was so exciting, the technology this just doesn't work yet. So what do we do? Well, 
the idea of having, and we all said early on, the idea of having a cage with no anchor, that's crazy. So let's get a little bit smarter, and this time let's put an anchor down. So this was the Villela gamma test. We're working our way through the alphabet here. Villela beta test, the first of Villela gamma, and we're hopefully going to get the Villela delta out there in the next few months. Here. So we wanted to go, we still wanted to capture the open ocean attributes there because we wanted to get all of that biological performance. But we wanted to stay in the same region because we didn't want to have to spend diesel dragging the cage around. So let's put the anchor down. And we thought if we're going to put the anchor down, let's do it within wireless range of the shore so we don't have to go and spend all that money on the satellite communication. And so this was the design that we came up with with a feed barge there, a, 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 a buoy at the top of the, the mooring line, a feed barge, and then the cage out behind that. And the plan was to go and put this out off Care Hall. Uh, it was six miles offshore in it was 10 kilometers if you're Canadian, uh, in 6,000 feet of water, two kilometers if you're Canadian. Uh, that's about half of the depth of the abyssal. <laughs> that wasn't magic. That's about half the depth. The, 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 the most of the open ocean out there is 12,000 feet deep. So we figured let's go and do this in 6,000 feet deep, but first of all, as the first step of the toe into the water, and then see how we go. And it was also being just six miles offshore, that was within um, wireless range so that we could do the remote feeding and the video monitoring. And the magic of this, it, 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 there were some ups initially over the first few months, but the last three or four months of grow out here, Gavin and Corey, our, our research team, who never guys that actually do all the work, I just do the arm waving and pipe ventilation. <coughs> but they would only have to go out on the offshore site one day a week to top up the fuel in the generator and top up the feed in the hopper. And the rest of it, they managed through their iPhones or through their laptop. Had Gavin, and we're, we're at an aquaculture conference in Seattle, and, and Gavin was sitting out in the lobby of the convention center in Seattle, and there's a crowd of people around him. And I walked up there, and just eavesdropping a little bit. People say, what are you doing, Gavin? What are you doing? He's like, I'm feeding the fish <laughs> <laughs> in Kona <laughs> in real time. <laughs> Want to watch? <laughs> it, it, it really is sweet. It, 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 it's true. The, the, the Lockheed Martin engineers really able to bring it together here to, to make this happen. I mean, it's, it's not surprising when you think about it. I mean, this is the day and age when we can land a robot on a comet. Think about that for a minute. I mean, that's pretty cool. The engineers can really do some great stuff. So just feeding the fish six miles offshore, pff, they ought to be able to nail that. Uh, it, it was really exciting to be able to see that. This was the uh, command and control center. It's a big plywood box, really, but we call it the command and control center. It's, it was the, the eyes and the brains and the ears and, and the belly. of the, the, So inside there was all of the remote command and control equipment and the feed hopper and the generator and the auger and the pumps. And that was we loaded onto uh, this landing craft here. You can see that's where the there since a 35 foot aluminum hull landing craft with the cage behind it and we towed it out there and we'd already deployed the mooring 6,000 feet of water we needed 12,000 feet of line so Gavin and Corey and the crew spent quite a bit of time splicing <laughs> to make it all come together but it worked this was at the the buoy the the barge and the cage behind we got full grow out all the way through and again also Local fishermen loved it, absolutely loved it. The boy is still out there, I was out there just yesterday. Uh, the boy is still out there and we do hope to get the next iteration of this out there again at some stage soon. This will be the the, uh, the Velella Delta, which will be part of a, a Lockheed Martin, the, the spin-off from this. Lockheed Martin was really impressed by what we were able to do as a research team, their engineers and our biologists, and they said, Let, let's run with this, but they're doing it under a, a separate company. They, a little bit nervous that the world's biggest defense contract and has a line item in there that says fish farming. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're nervous about what somebody might ask at the shareholders meeting. So that, that's now Forever Oceans, and the Forever Oceans engineers have been out here for over a year now, squirreled away there, coming up with the Valella Delta. We're hoping to deploy that out here in the next four to six months if the federal government gives us the permits. We're still, it's only been 22 months so far. We've been very patient. 
um, and local fishermen are calling us up every couple of weeks. We we'll get somebody on the phone saying, "Where are you guys going to put the cage?" Back? <laughs> so further, why do we why do we want to go further? Well, it's because we can because there are permits there. Places like Norway, Turkey, and Chile are already pushing their industry out into deeper water further offshore. There's less stress on the fish in, in, in deeper water. This, Nicole Kirchhoff has done this work on southern bluefin tuna down in South Australia. And she measured the hormone, the stress hormones in fish. And fish are in deeper water further offshore or less stressed than fish in shallow water. We've shown both here with our work, which is the Lola Project in the Neo Benedinia, uh, that there's better fish health, but then also some evidence, this is anecdotal evidence from Chile, is that salmon rickettsia syndrome, which is a bacteria that infects the salmon, and Calagus, which is a sea lice, a copepod parasite. They're also less of a problem in deep water sites in Chile. And it's better growth and better survival. That's really important from an economic perspective, a commercial perspective, when you're looking at a business plan there. And that's from our Valoa Port performance. So I would posit that actually we're not being pushed offshore here. We're being lured out offshore by the siren call of better growth and better fish health. So, Yahoo, no problems, right? Well, there still are. We've still got to get the federal permits. And it's actually technically not possible to get a commercial permit in federal waters anywhere in the US except for the Gulf of Mexico. And it's only possible in the Gulf of Mexico for the last six weeks. <laughs> so it was only six weeks ago that they finally came up with the rules for getting a permit to grow fish commercially in federal mm. waters. We do have some increasing recognition. Catherine Sullivan, who's the head of NOAA administration had gone and, and said this very forcefully uh, at the Seafood Summit in New Orleans in 2015. The federal government does understand the importance of aquaculture. It's just there's a lot of moving parts here. There's a lot of different agencies and getting them all to work together. The local Westpac Fisheries Council here in Hawaii and in the other Pacific Islands is moving forward with a plan to have aquaculture in federal waters. It's just we're going to base it on the experience in the Gulf of Mexico. It's going to be five to ten, maybe fifteen years away. So, okay, but at least there is some recognition that we need to move out offshore. Mostly, part of why I'm so excited about being able to speak to you all is I figure that there are of the nine, well, there's, there's, there's seven billion people on the planet now. <clears throat> Probably about three billion of those understand the importance of aquaculture because they eat farmed fish a lot. And that's mostly in Southeast Asia and China, that those people really understand the importance of aquaculture. The other 4 billion people don't have a clue. And so I challenge you all, please, to help spread the word about the importance of responsibly farmed fish. We face some huge challenges out there. There's this wall of misinformation. There has been in the last three or four years a real pivotal point, a turning point, in most of the NGOs, the conservation groups, environmental NGOs, now recognize that we need more aquaculture and that properly sited net pen aquaculture should be encouraged rather than up until that time they've been very anti aquaculture. There's still a huge disconnect in most of the public's mindset. You ask somebody standing at the fish counter, they're looking at farm fish and wild fish, ask them which they prefer, they'll almost invariably say wild fish. Right, yeah, so you like wild chickens? Well, you eat wild cows? <laughs> so, so you get this, this sort of thing. From, you get this, I, I drive my wife and kids nuts when we go to the supermarket, or when we're sitting at a restaurant. Was it a, a restaurant at, at the Aquaculture Society uh, meeting in Las Vegas uh, just a, a couple of months ago? And we went out to McCormick and Schmidt's, just a couple of blocks away from where the convention was. Figured this is a, a real high-end seafood place. They'll be able to really not just give us sustainably farmed fish, but tell a story behind that as well. Here on the menu, it was uh, organic wild isle salmon. I'm not, I, actually, I should hesitate. I'm not sure that it was, let's put, it was wild isle salmon. I'm not sure whether they had said it was organic or not. But I figured it's, it's Atlantic salmon, and it's got to be farmed. There's not 
there's no wild Atlantic salmon out there anymore because we've hunted them all to extinction. So I asked the waiters, I tend to do it. So this wild isle salmon here, is that farmed or wild? Have you heard this text about the island? <laughs> and he cringed. He didn't want to have to answer, but he's like, well, it's, it's farmed, but it's farmed in the wild. <laughs> <laughs> you, sir, are going in the next presentation. <laughs> you know, but there's this sort of misinformation out here, this fear mongering from, from groups. And we see this in the Gulf of Mexico, as I said, six weeks ago, finally, after 15 years of work and repeated EAs and public consultation, the federal government came up with a plan for responsible, modest growth in aquaculture in the Gulf of Mexico between three and 200 miles offshore. And of course, these three people, the Circulating Farms Coalition, Food and Water Watch, and Center for Food Safety, they are dyed in the wool anti-aquaculture advocates. They hate the idea of any fish farming in the ocean for reasons that escape me completely. There's no rational reason. This was the lawsuit that they filed against NOAA, saying, yep, you can't do that. That's, that's fish farming, that's not fishing. And, various reasons against the regulations that Noah had established. That was predictable. Rick's, we know these three groups, they were opposed to it. They had opposed our fish farm out here off Pear Holly Point. They would opposed our expansion of that operation. They, ex, they opposed pretty much every idea of fish growing in the ocean. That was expected. What's the tragedy is that they're also signed on to this lawsuit to stop fish farming in the Gulf of Mexico about eight or nine Fishermen's Association. I'm going to grab those guys by the scruff of the neck and bring them out here and have them talk to our local mm -hmm. Monica Howe fishermen about the aquaculture. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> Easy question, <Joe. laughs> That's No, not you, Sid. You're a, yeah. no, no, right ahead, Sid. Money and we, we cannot get breed stock for love or money at this point. We just there's money over on the helo side. We got one there a couple of weeks ago, but it got to the tank and it's over. Right. We've got a small Echicellus, the, the what they call them, cane knife money. Uh, but one <coughs> Echicellus is not the commercial species, so we're struggling there. I'm talking to Dan Vanetti. If anybody yeah, these are brood stock. We, we want to do some research on mahi. Mahi are an incredibly fast growing fish, great tasting. Um, they've got huge potential. Uh, it's just there are some challenges to growing in the ground. <coughs> yet. So if anybody wants to go fishing for mahi mahi and you catch a small one, throw your other fish out of your cooler, put some salt water in the cooler, and bring it back to us alive, we will pay you name a price. <laughs> 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 We're also, we've got some funding also to go and do some work with Nanue, which some of you may know, it's the, the rudder fish. Beautiful thing about Nanue is it's an herbivorous fish. It's like the bison of the oceans. It's here in Hawaii, it's very highly regarded as a food fish. And it's also right there in the South Pacific, Southeast Asia, very highly regarded. There's some of them here in America, in the Gulf of Mexico, but people don't, Americans don't like the idea of a fish that eats algae because it has an algae flavor to it. We have done some work with Nanue, some preliminary work that shows that you are what you eat. If you feed a good diet to Nanue, it tastes great. We took a sample up to Sam Choi and he was ecstatic. <laughs> and it's an herbivorous fish. It eats algae. There are problems with algae in Kaneohe Bay and Maui where they've got this algae that's just over it. We need fish to graze that down. Seems like a wonderful logical step. We need to figure out how to raise those in the hatchery. Sid, when he was working with us before, got one new no, way in the hatchery. Several. Several. Yeah. But we need to have, figure out how to do that consistently and how to get the fish to spawn and then scale that up. So, yeah, we are looking at other species as well. If you can put an anchor at 6,000 feet, it seems like you have a lot of ocean you can use without having. Is the currents just because it's it's a good model, it's a good test, or is there an economic advantage? I mean, 
it seems like an anchor just being able to operate it on the cell phone, that just solves some of the problems. Right. And so that, that Bilella Beta test, that unanchored page, I mean, that's gone onto the dustbin of history. You know, we're, we're not going to go do that again. In the next stages that we will do when we're looking to commercialize this and always use an anchor. The unanchored stuff, it was worth trying. I mean, it, it was, it, it, you know, you, you, part of, of the fun of science is you never know until you try. Would you go back, is there any reason to go back to it if you could solve the um, chase the down? Yeah, but that, that actually, it, it's possible, um, but the, the, the challenge there, we thought it was just insolvable because it turns out that uh, when we looked at the drag coefficients, the amount of you know, towing, the amount of diesel that you burn, it all depends on how much drag there is. But we, we were thinking, well, the engineers can come up with some sort of streamlined cage, a cage that's shaped like a submarine or something that will have less drag. And that actually doesn't work out because the mesh, the, the fingers on the mesh, it pretty much doesn't matter which way they are oriented in the water, it still creates about the same amount of drag. If you drag it straight through this way, or dragging it along through this way, it's still equal amounts of turbulence which creates the drag. And so then the, it, it doesn't matter what shape the cage is going to be. The best <coughs> shape of the cage actually is a sphere because then you've got minimum surface area for maximum volume. And that's what we had. Uh, does the current, because you talked about the advantage of the current going through the cage to keep the parasites down, yeah. um, does that change? Because it seems like if you're free floating, you have less. Yes, right. yes, there, there was less time. Yes. So, and you can't, because of the diesel, you can't drag it all the time. So, are you getting fewer parasites with an anchored cage? Uh, it, we, with the anchored cage, we had no proliferation of parasites and we didn't clean the cage once with a whole blowout cycle. So, yeah, that, that, that we had a, uh, auto veining, that's a term that we invented for that, that the cage was auto veining itself. No matter which way the currents were coming from, you had an up current and down current part of the cage, and so the just got flooded down the back of the cage. So that was not particularly helpful with a parasite there. So that worked very well for us. Is, is the copper in the cage construction material essential for controlling the biofouling, or is it? Good question. That's, that's been a major issue about using copper in any of these things over the years. And so, you said that you didn't have, you were able to control the biofouling easily. Isn't that partly because of the structural material? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, we, we, we love the idea of, of copper alloys. Uh, and in the past, there have been environmental concerns about people using copper based paints on netting. And they're very valid concerns because the, the netting will, will bend and flex, and the copper based paint will flake off and fall to the bottom underneath the cage or you'll get a little bit of biofouling on there so you'll go along with the brushes to clean up the paint will fall to bottom and you'll get an accumulation of copper flakes underneath the cage and that's become bioactive and, and copper is highly toxic to most marine organisms but invertebrates uh thank you yes the coal thing fish that one sure but the the copper metal the beauty of that is that, that it won't flake off that it, it will dissolve over time there's a, a the longest serving copper cage, brass cage down in Chile has been in the water for eight years uh, in an offshore site and it, it's still functional. So it does dissolve over time, all metals do, but it's at a very, very slow rate. Uh, and that's just copper ions, that's nothing accumulating onto the, the substrate underneath, that's just copper ions drifting off into the ocean, which is uh, environmentally benign. The International Copper Association has gone and tested that extensively. My curiosity with respect to a week or two ago, there was a large work boat off Keiho, um, 200 foot work boat, orange ball, base top size, a crane. Is that working on your site? We should have the money for a map like that. Right? <laughs> 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 yeah, somebody wants to sign a check for that, for that sort of, yeah. Was it, did somebody know what that was? That what was, was a huge. That? And they're, all, they're up and down the coast quite Everybody's a bit. Everybody's been talking about yeah. it. Yeah. Nobody seemed to know. Yeah. Can we, can we take it maybe? No, because that was a large work boat, maybe 200 foot lead boat with a. Uh, I think a mobile crane on its after deck or something. Yeah. Yeah. Gavin had said something that he thought that it was a boat that's used for Navy SEALs. 
I think it's and had lights like both. Yeah. It's been in Honolulu for 10 years now. It's a long term contract for the Navy, and they used it for submersible work and chasing torpedoes from wherever they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was the boat that I recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, that was cool. And it, it was there for several days. Or whatever. Oh, I don't think it's there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not good. Not that I would love to talk about that. <laughs> Did you do any work? Uh, I see the boat you used was Machias, which is the same boat that I used for my dissertation. <laughs> it shows a good vessel. Uh, we used it because we didn't have the diesel bus because we sailed for the whole thing. Was there any attempt to try and find out if you could keep the uh, propulsion costs down by sailing? I realize then you need more manpower. Uh, and there, there's a trade off, but I'm just curious if that was part of the test. Precisely, Tom. That, that's exactly where I think you go on as, as well. We were figuring out you could just sail. You wouldn't need to use any diesel at all. You could maybe even hold it in position. Mm -hmm. No, that doesn't work. And uh, um, uh, Bill Austin, who's the skipper of the Machias, and was when I yeah, used it. <laughs> this guy's <laughs> been on a long time. Like eighty years old, and he, he, the entire eight months that we were out there with the Vanilla Beta test, he was on board and. Happy as Larry. Right. The one week when the Coast Guard insisted he had to come in ashore and get an EKG, let to make sure that his heart was okay. <laughs> he was just as grumpy as a bear <laughs> for the time that he was on shore. And I've never seen Bill so happy as when we were taking him back out to the boat. He knew he had another, another four months on the boat. This guy's a phenomenon. Uh, and, and Bill had said, <laughs> No, it's not going to sail. You've got this huge. Thing you're dragging along behind you, you can only you won't be able to control the direction you're going. You can only with sailing, you need to be moving through the water for your rudder to be able to bite, to be able to you know, stop it in the wind. Case like that, because it's just the boat wants to pop that way. On that same subject, then, since if you don't do sailing, suppose you use uh, liquid robotics wave gliders and a fleet of them. I, I did some paint tests showing the track, tractor pull capability of that. It's not, uh, you know, there's a lot of development needs to go before that would come. It seems like that might be a possible way to get the uh, yeah. what you need. Yeah, yeah. And, and in my dreams, I would lie awake at 2 o'clock in the morning and stare at the ceiling and think about that. Yeah. <laughs> that or um, using uh, droves to, to drop down into deeper water currents that could reposition you. But that's the stuff that's, of science. That's going to be the. That's, the waves are a lot more regular than the, than the difference between currents. So, on, on those same thoughts, again, thinking on the economic side, an anchor seems pretty cheap. How expensive is that anchor compared to sails or underwater droves? Or? Uh, a lot less expensive. The, the, you know, the, the Machias over an eight-month trip. That's for a that's small, very cheap. Uh, and that, that, uh, cheap. Yeah. Bill was doing this for love, not money. Uh, but that's only really small. Take it to Cape for 2,000 fish, and we have to be thinking about what technologies are going to work here for us to be able to do hundreds of thousands of fish at a time, to be able to do it consistently, so that you can look an investor in the eye when he's about to sign the check. You can look him in the eye and say, "Yes, we know how to do this. Can you do it? This is minimal risk to it." So. Yes, yeah, so all of our commercial focus now is on the board, taking some of the drifter cage stuff, which is a lot of fun, but we've got to have an anchor. Mm -hmm. Both okay. accurately <laughs> and metaphorically. Exactly. You've got to be anchored. Okay. Yes. I have just two quick, kind of unrelated questions. Um, would it be possible to attach like a motor or something to the, to the cage to, to let it catch those currents, and or would it throw off the balance? Have you thought of that at all? That and your second one? Yeah, my second one is um, the fish that you had um, raised with the fish meal and with the tofu, was there a taste difference between them? Just my two questions. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I'll answer that one first because <laughs> that, that's one of the burdens that we bear. It's, it's, it's just this is something that we grit our teeth every so often and come down to the lab and sit out the crackers <laughs> of sashimi and have to go and wade our way through them and just make sure that the fish from this trial tasted the same as the compatriore should taste. And we just do that because that's part of our dedication to the 
And those fish were, there was no discernible difference. Good point. We could have tested it for you. We could have been testers. No discernible difference. And we do that for all of the, the uh, trials that we do here because it, it's really important to us that we still want that wow factor. Those, those of you who taste Kimpachi, everybody remembers, pretty much everybody remembers the first their first kiss. And everybody pretty much remembers <laughs> the first time they tasted Kimpachi. Uh, <laughs> so we want to make sure that there's that same That's wow, cool. and their eyes go back That's and they hear the magic music. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> do you test yeah. like the fat contents? Yes, we do that as well. Uh, both, not just the amount of fat, but the specific, um, e each of the, the profiles mm -hmm. of the fatty acids in there, because that's really critical that we want to make sure that we're not messing with the heart healthy omega 3 fatty acids mm -hmm. that, are, that are in there that are so important for human health. Uh, and we also want to look at the amino acid profile in there as well. So we want to make sure that that, that is done. Veterinary nutritional science is a very, very sophisticated um, business now. Um, and, and there's some great, great nutritionists out there. Um, we've worked with a guy who is from up in Montana, uh, works for USDA uh, Agri Agriculture Research Service up in Montana doing, he does formulations for trout, but he's also just, he's a demigod mm -hmm. in, in the fish feed world. Um, we're hoping to have him come and actually do some work with us here over the, the coming years because he's really, really good at what he does. So that was the, the, the fish feed. Yes, we do um, testing to make sure that the, the product quality is the same. That's really important to us. And the first question was, I know it, I forget this. Um, could you add a motor to add yes, a motor? Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, great thought. And actually, they've tested this with an aquapod down in Puerto Rico uh, where they had uh, a... This is a lot larger cage. This cage here is 132 cubic meters, so it's about 22 feet in diameter. The cage I had in Puerto Rico was 60 feet in diameter, and it was 3,000 cubic meters. Wow. They put two big propellers on the back of it, or they, they made it the back of it because the propellers were, and they, they were not what you would normally expect from a boat propeller, but they were very, very big, very slow moving, but apparently this is the most efficient for a slow moving propeller, sort of like a, a tugboat or something. And they tested this and they unhooked the anchor that's holding this aquapod in there and they were able to move it and steer it. Uh, it still doesn't, having the, the propeller on the cage doesn't <coughs> solve the problem. It's going to take a lot of power to push that mesh through the water. And so that's how it's going to be feasible. So it doesn't matter whether you've got it on a boat that's towing or a barge that's pushing or on a cage. Yes? If you project it out into the future of having a, you know, a fairly sizable farm and pulling these I mean, anchors in and out, what are the, 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 the costs of it versus how much you get out of it? What is going to get cost of a pound of a fish coming out of there? It's probably the first... Uh, a few times that you do it, the first five or ten years, it's probably going to be very expensive. I mean, the Kampachi is a very I'm expensive. talking about your projections for the, you know, like for a big company. What would you say would it cost you? Two dollars a pound? Five dollars a pound? In, in, if, let's say, 15 or 20 years down the track, and we've got some efficiency of scale and some more experience behind it, uh, I would expect us to be able to get this very close to farm salmon prices, which is seven, eight dollars a pound in Costco, mm -hmm. an ounce of filet. I would expect us to be able to get there. The analogy I like to point people to is cell phones. I mean, back in the 1980s, the only people that had cell phones were like the, 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 the guys, the, the financial guys in Manhattan, because Manhattan was the only place that had cell phones. They had these car phones. <laughs> you just take two hands to lift up and, and talk to them. They work. And now, for a fraction of the cost, everybody's got a supercomputer in their pocket. And these things now are uh, economic development drivers throughout the planet. And my hope is that over time, the same trend will happen here with 
open ocean aquaculture technology because it will get cheaper, it will get more efficient, uh, we'll be able to scale it, and it will be able to go global. I've answered all of your questions, and thank you all very much again. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great.